Nice guys finish last, a phrase that initially may have derived from a Brooklyn Dodgers manager. Since then, this phrase has been applied to numerous aspects of life, such as dating, business, sports, and much more. But do nice guys actually finish last in life? Actually, I'm here to explain that nice guys, in fact, do not finish last in life, no matter the species. This, of course, does include humans. However, I'm also going to tell you particularly what type of nice guys do not finish in last, as there certainly are some nice guys who will finish in last in the game of life. Within the selfish gene, Richard Dawkins explains why evolution has positively selected for a particular nice guy behavior. In fact, you'll even be able to test this particular strategy out yourself if you desire and perhaps even apply it to your own life. Allow me to begin by once again emphasizing that some nice guys will indeed finish in last. These overly nice guys can be referred to as suckers. And remember, although I use the word guys, this applies to every single organism, whether that is an animal, plant, insect, virus, etc. Suckers are overly altruistic in helping other organisms pass down their genes at the expense of their own success. Hence, sucker behavior was not positively selected for in evolution. Furthermore, mean guys also will eventually finish in last. These overly mean guys can be referred to as cheats. However, there is a particular group of nice guys using a particular strategy that will not only not finish in last, but often finish first in the game of life. These nice guys can be referred to as grudgers, and this is the strategy that has been positively selected for in evolution. Grudgers came to dominate the population because they passed on more genes to future generations than either suckers or cheats. One can better comprehend this theory through game theory, or the simple prisoner's dilemma game. Imagine two partners in crime being investigated independently. The police tell both prisoners that if they snitch each other out, they will serve no time, but their friend will serve three years. However, if both friends rat on each other, they will both be forced to serve two years. If neither of them rat, they will both only serve one year since there is insufficient evidence. Hence, the ideal situation for both of them combined is for both to cooperate with each other and stay silent. The worst situation overall is for both of them to defect and both end up serving two years, a total of four years served between them. However, for the case where the independent friend rats but the other doesn't, the one who ratted will benefit the most, serving zero time, where the one who stayed silent and did not rat will end up serving the worst possible punishment for himself, three years. With that said, it seems as though defecting would be the reasonable strategy since there is no way of knowing what the other prisoner's decision will be despite them being friends. However, in the game of life, we see that the prisoner's dilemma is not played just once, rather it is played repeatedly. Hence, this allows both parties to either gain trust over time or gain mistrust over time for the other party. Thus, the parties will then be able to choose if they want to forgive or hold a constant grudge over the other party's actions. The game of prisoner's dilemma can be played in a repeated fashion by giving two cards to two players. One card is to cooperate and the other is to defect. Outcome one would be both players cooperating and the bank would pay each of the players $300 each. Outcome two involves both players defecting and the bank fines both players $10. Now outcome three consists of one player defecting and the other cooperating, thus the defector will receive $500 while the other cooperator is fined. $100. Outcome 4 is simply the vice versa of outcome 3 with the players swapped. After 10 rounds of the game, I can theoretically win as much as $5,000, but only if you have been very foolish to cooperate every single time while I defect every single time. The ideal outcome is for both of us to cooperate and pick up $3,000 each, total of $6,000, by both cooperating at the expense of the bank or we can constantly play the defect card and the banker will have won $100 from both of us being the worst possible scenario. Most likely is that we will partially trust one another and play some kind of a mixed sequence. Now this simple game is constantly being played out in nature and this is precisely why you will see animals helping out one another. It can be extremely fascinating to watch animals act altruistically towards one another. As a child, I used to ask myself how they knew to do that. Well, they may 
not actually need to know how to do that. This adjusts their pre-programmed behavior according to their genetics. And it just so happened that the genetics containing this pre-programmed altruistic behavior exist today for us to witness. This is because it was these genes that were successful in being passed down generations, while those that were not altruistic in behavior failed to be passed down. The animal isn't acting consciously, it just so happens that this was the behavior created by the genes that have survived through the years of evolution. It was positively selected for. According to a study published in the December 9th, 2011 issue of Science, rats were shown to act altruistically towards one another. The rats were placed in pens with two cages. In one was another rat, and the other was a pile of chocolate chips. The unhindered rats could have easily eaten all the chocolate chips for themselves, but instead, most of the rodents opened up both cages and shared the sweets with one another. These rats aren't acting out of sympathy, however, don't get mixed up. This behavior is influenced by the expectation that the other rats will now owe the rats who liberated them in the future. The same behavior was observed in vampire bats in a 1984 study published in Nature. When the vampire bats went out and had very successful hunts, they would often be very full with blood. However, some bats, on the other hand, would not have been so lucky. A bat that is very full could benefit slightly by digesting all of the blood, or it can digest just what is required for it to survive and donate the extra blood to an unlucky bat that got no blood. Nigel Barber, a psychologist, stated it well when he said, The adaptive rationale behind all this is a sort of insurance policy. You pay in a small amount and benefit when you need it later. One day, that full bat may not be so lucky on the hunt, but the bat that it helped out in the past will be there to then assist it. Hence, it made sense why these bats were not only helping to feed close kin, but also to complete stranger bats that have no genetic relation. It was simply to build an insurance for the future. Trust. This is played out even on the smallest scales of life as well. In order to keep themselves free of ectoparasites, birds and many other animals will often scratch themselves. However, they can't exactly reach the top of their head in many species. Hence, another bird will often have to help them out do it. While it seems very small, the bird still has to expend some energy energy and time in order to help scratch the other. This is not forgotten and is expected to be paid back sometime in the future. What happens if the bird doesn't help scratch the other head in the future though? Well, this would be the equivalent to defecting in the prisoner's dilemma game. Now the victim bird who was owed a scratch can either continue to cooperate by helping the other bird like a an idiot, or it can continue to hold a grudge and never trust that bird again. Or, as a third alternative, the bird can hold a temporary grudge, but still help it out in the future if that other bird eventually decides to cooperate. Considering we see this behavior frequently in nature, it can only mean that it was this genetic behavior that was most successful in survival. If it was not effective, then we would never see animals acting altruistically towards one another. Now, back to the Prisoner's Dilemma game that we discussed earlier. In 1980, Robert Axelrod, professor of political science at the University of Michigan, held a tournament of various strategies for the Prisoner's Dilemma. He invited a number of well-known game theorists to submit strategies to be run by computers. In the tournament, programmers played games against each other and themselves repeatedly. Each strategy specified whether to cooperate or defect based on the previous moves, both the strategy and its opponent. An example of one of the submitted strategies was always defect. This strategy defects on every single turn. This is what game theory advocates. It is the safest strategy since it cannot be taken advantage of. However, it misses the chance to gain larger payoffs by cooperating with an opponent who is ready to cooperate. After allowing all the strategies to play against one another in 200 round games, the winning strategy was one of the most simple ones with only several lines of codes. It was called tit for tat. The strategy cooperates on the very first move, thus a nice strategy, and then does whatever its opponent has done on the previous move, thus when matched against the all defective strategy, tit for tat strategy always defects after the first move. When matched against the all cooperating strategy, tit for tat always cooperates. This strategy has the benefit of both cooperating with a friendly opponent, getting the full benefits of cooperation and of defecting when matched against an opponent who defects. 
when matched against itself, the tit-for-tat strategy always cooperates, of course. It's a nice strategy because it initially cooperates and it also has a short-term memory. It does not hold long-term grudges. Only right after the opposing player defects will it defect, a short-term grudge. Not only this, but eight out of the 15 strategies that were submitted happened to be nice, and those 8 also happened to have the highest overall scores, while the 7 nasty or mean strategies had the lowest overall scores. Wow, so does this mean that nice guys may actually not finish in last? Precisely, but this is not to say that they finish first always either. Putting the tit for tat strategy up against any strategy will always lead to either a loss or at best a tie since it always cooperates initially and thus could be taken advantage of. Tit for tat only wins overall throughout multiple games with different strategies. Then again, in real life, we don't simply play one single game. We have numerous dilemmas like this constantly every single day, minor or large. However, it is also important to note that tit for tat success also depends on its environment. Had there been 14 nasty strategies, Tit for Tat would not have come out on top and would have been mostly exploited. Had there been mostly nice strategies, Tit for Tat would have done even better. But in evolution, successful strategies are the strategies that do well when they are numerous. Otherwise, the population would fail to grow. So to really put the strategies to the test, as would be done in real life evolution, a Darwinian aspect was added to the game. Winning strategies to each round would be rewarded with offspring in the next generation or round becoming more numerous. Over time, the nasty strategies only lost more while the nice strategy succeeded. In fact, Tit for Tat in particular won 5 out of the 6 games played. With that said, while Tit for Tat, the strategy itself, may not always be the ideal strategy for any given situation you find yourself in, in general, it does appear that the majority of the time, nice strategies involving more cooperation with the other party will be more beneficial. So, while nice guys will certainly not always come in first, it's quite clear that nasty guys will come in last extremely more frequently in the game of life. However, there is an exception to this. There can be no knowledge of the game duration. Otherwise, built trust will not matter in the last round or as the rounds are closing out. Both parties will always defect, thus exploiting nice strategies. An interesting example that Dawkins mentioned was a live and let live system in trench warfare in World War I since the potential duration of World War I was completely unknown for a period. A British staff officer on tour of the trenches remarked that he was astonished to observe German soldiers walking about within rifle range behind their own line. As he stated, our men appeared to take no notice. I privately made up my mind to do away with that sort of thing when we took over. Such things should not be allowed. These people evidently did not know there was a war on. Both sides apparently believed in the policy of live and let live. Despite senior officials advocating against this, it still continued. In fact, after an accidental German salvo arrived, a German actually apologized, stating, We are very sorry about that. We hope nobody was hurt. The altruistic behavior is literally seen everywhere in nature. For instance, a fig wasp will help pollinate the fig while also laying its eggs in there. Now, if the wasp only decides to lay the eggs and not pollinate the fig, the fig tree will cut off the fig, killing all the wasp's potential offspring. So, nice guys can finish first. They don't always, depending on the population and other variables involved, but overall, the nasty guys will tend to finish last much more often. The evidence is in how all organisms have simply evolved successfully. This doesn't mean that you should start f***ing simping for girls, though. That won't help you out by any means. This would be the equivalent to constantly cooperating like an idiot while the one you're simping for is defecting. What you should do is subscribe and like this video. Maybe watch this video too if you think that simping will actually help you for whatever delusional reason. There's nothing that will make a man more self-conscious than being rejected. And why, because why is he rejected? Well, obviously, Mother Nature, in the guise of that particular woman, has said, you're not so bad for a friend, but there's no reason that your genetic material should propagate itself into the future 